Hey guys, what's up? In this video, we're going to talk about the sphere of Ho, try to explain exactly what that is. So if you know anything about Kabbalah concepts, you already know there's what's called the 10 spherot. The 10 spherot are basically these 10 filters or 10 uh, translating tools that transmit you, the endless self that is kind of beyond the body and is then channeled through these 10 layers, 10 filters, 10 tools, 10 mechanisms really, to manifest you in a physical form. So when I do this, I'm actually using my 10 sphero because what's happening is me, the self, the endless self that is beyond this entire composite of tools, is somehow now going through those 10 layers and manifesting in a physical, practical form in the tangible, physical world. So you're basically translating something intangible, which is the self, which is you, the neshama, the endless consciousness, somehow is now being translated into something which is now finite and manifest and reflected, really, in the physical world. So there's 10 of those. Now, the first three of those spherot are kind of like the main ones. That's Keter, Chachma, and Bina. And we've spoken a little about those on the channel, and there's going to be more videos coming out at some point about what those are, too. But then we have these seven lower spherot. And the seven lower spherot are the ones that are more well-known. They're translated at, they're, they're called Chesed, Gvura, Tiferet, Netzach, Hod, Yesod, and Malchut. And those are the seven lower spherot, and they're kind of qualitatively different than the, the three upper ones. So we're going to zoom in on just one of them, the sphere of Hod in this episode, in this video, because I want to try to clarify that one specifically now, because this is actually the day that I'm making this video is the day of Sfirat Omer, which is called Hod Sheba Hod. In other, word, in other words, it's basically the, the day in which you have all of the energy of the day is about this concept of Hod. Additionally, Hod is kind of like one of these spheroids that kind of gets like a like a raw deal. It's not super known exactly what it means when you compare it to something like the sphere of Netzach, which is seemingly its opposite. Netzach means to be dominant. And we're going to talk about what that means in a second in comparison to Hod. Uh, but like that's like a little bit more well-known. The idea of being a dominating persona, we understand where that fits. We kind of get that socially, like in the world, and how that impacts how we manifest in the world, why I manifest in a dominating way, that's the sphere of Netzach. Similarly, we have the sphere called Chesed, which usually is translated as kindness, although that's really not a very good translation of what it is either. And so Chesed is kind of like this obvious thing, Well, we all kind of think that kindness is a good idea, and so therefore it's kind of just, well, that's a way to manifest in the world. But I want to sort of show you how not only are those two spheroid a little bit more complex than they seem, but we're going to use them as like a foil for the sphere of Hod, and that's going to give us clarity exactly on what the sphere of Hod really is. So the way to do this is to understand that there, in, in the lower seven spheroid, there are actually pairs, and those pairs are Chesed goes with Gevura, and Netzach goes with Hod. And there's this, this middle line, where in the middle we have, that's kind of not paired, we have Tiferet, and we have Yesod, and we have Malchut. So we're going to ignore the middle line of those three, and we're going to focus now just on Chesed and Gvura and Netzach and Hod, and just sort of show how these are meant to be paired because they're actually opposite qualities, and it's the ability to move between them and to know when to use each of these opposite qualities that really gives us the full manifestation, the full expression of the Neshama into the world. So I want to show exactly what I mean by that. So the idea of Chesed and Gvura is being paired, so that really starts to make it a little weird. Like, well, if Gvura means to restrain yourself, basically means to have discipline, to hold yourself in, and Chesed, if we translate it as kindness, kindness is not really the opposite of Gvura. It's not the opposite of restraint. So the idea of kindness being the opposite of, of restraint doesn't really work. So then what is the opposite of restraint? Well, if you think for a second, you'll probably realize that, that if restraint means to kind of like hold myself in, well then Chesed, which is the opposite of restraint, should be to let myself out, to be to share, essentially. And that's actually the definition of chesed. And we're not going to delve in that, into that too much right now, but the concept of chesed basically means to share yourself, and the concept of gvura means to hold yourself back from being shared. Now, in contrast, or kind of the lower stage of that, the netzach and hod aspects, so netzach, we can define it as being dominant. So basically, I'm now, I'm, I'm manifesting in a way that now I'm kind of dominating people that are around me. Well, what exactly does hod mean? What is the opposite of dominant? Now, before we explain what that could mean, I mean, you could think of it as, well, maybe it means to be submissive. If I'm dominating, that means that the opposite of to, of to be dominating is to be is to submit to somebody else. But there's another weird thing about the word hod. See, netzach and chesed and gvura, these are all words that are in Hebrew. And the Hebrew of the word actually tells us a lot about the word. And we can do that with each of the words of the ten spirot. But the word hod is like this weird word. And it's translated as glory or some kind of like, like there's like this glow. It's the idea of a glow. So why would that be like, let's say, let's say it does mean to be submissive, right? The idea of opposite of dominance is to submit. Well, then why would the word for submitting be, you know, the equivalent of the word 
for glowing. And also, what does it even mean to glow? Like, what is the idea of that at all? So let's try to dig into that now for a second. So we actually have a story in the Chumash which talks about this in the Torah, in the, in, and, and it's, it's a story about the, the, the first and the main, I guess you could say, character that embodied this trait of Hod in the Chumash itself. That's actually in Parshas Kitisa. It's, uh, it's, the character is Moshe, and there's a story where Moshe basically spends a very long time up on Mount Sinai. He's having this whole, this whole back and forth with Hashem, the source of all reality, the endless one, the, 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 the super consciousness that is manifest as the diversity that we experience as the world. And then when that story ends and Moshe comes down from that mountaintop, so the Torah tells us that he's actually glowing. It's that his face is glowing. And, and similarly, later on, there's a discussion of how the Torah tells us how Moshe needs to kind of give some of his connection with Hashem, with the source of reality. He has to give that over to his student, whose name is Yoshua. And so basically, he has to give of his hod, some of his glory to Yoshua. So this language of hod, of glory, is found with Moshe, and it's described as a glow in his face, that he actually, literally, he kind of glows in the dark. So what exactly is that? Like, what's the, what, 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 like, why is that the result of coming down from the mountaintop? What does that, have, what does it even mean? So there's actually a commentary on that story, which is called the Orachim. He describes exactly what happened in that story that made Moshe glow. And he says what happened was that when Moshe was actually in this consciousness state with Hashem, where he was basically receiving all the information, the divine mappings, the perspectives, all the knowledge and, and, and pictures of reality. So he actually had to enter a certain state of mind, a certain state of being in order to do that. And that state of being is called anava. It's basically, we trans translate anava usually as the idea of humility, but anava actually means, it's from the language of poverty. And what you're basically saying is you're, you have to move yourself out of the way, kind of like and it's not, it's not just to submit yourself and say, I now submit to somebody who's above me. The idea of anava is that I'm basically saying, okay, you know what? I am poor. I have nothing of my own. I'm making this space now. If, if you have nothing, you have room inside of you to receive anything and everything because there's just so much room, so much emptiness from the nothingness that you have. And that's actually why it, it, that this idea, the word anava, is often translated as being humble because true humility is not saying that I'm nothing. True humility means saying, I realize that all the everything that I have and that I am, well, none of it comes with me when I leave the world. None of it, a lot of it is not even because of me. I owe so much of my, even my, my very existence, I owe it to my parents, to things that came, to people that came before me, to other people giving to me and, and providing me with opportunities to become. And so, so much of who we are is not our own. It actually comes from people that are beyond us, that are outside of us. And so the idea that the, that the Orachim describes with Moshe in the story there is that in order for Moshe to actually receive all of the divine flow, the download of Hashem's presence into his own being, and then to become a person who is like a channel for that, he basically had to get his own ego out of the way. He had to say, okay, me as an isolated self, where I think of myself as if there is just me, and I'm uh, like, and which leads inherently to a certain arrogance. Like, well, what I have is mine. I made it. I did all of it, and it's just me. And other people are just kind of like they just serve me in some way to give me the things that I deserve to have in order to be able to achieve those things. That is the opposite of being receptive. That's the opposite of being anav. Anava means looking at yourself as if you are poor, not poor financially, but poor in the sense that all the things that you have in your life they are all gifts. They came from somewhere outside of you, and to see see them that way, and that actually makes you more open to receiving more and more. When you're a person who is anav, you look at the world from a place of, not from a place of privilege, and saying, oh, well, I actually deserve all this. Instead, it's from a place of, there's so much that I'm being given, and I'm, and I'm always looking to receive the other gifts that are flowing in my direction. And that concept, the idea of getting yourself out of the way in that way to be able to receive, getting your ego, your sense of isolated self, that's what the definition of ego is, me in isolation, you can get that out of the way, you can then receive what's being gifted to you. That's not only is that the, the concept of anava, the idea there is that what, what Moshe was doing is that he actually, when you get yourself out of the way, and then that opens you up to receive that flow, well, well relative to Hashem, the way that looks is you can think of it as Hashem is kind of like the super self, and then you're like this little self, and when you have a strong ego, that little self blocks out the universe, the bigger self, the total self that is that is all of reality, the Ain Sof, the endless one. But when you can get that ego blockage out of the way, you can actually become a channel for that, and it can flow through you. And that's actually why, so the Orachim writes there, as in that commentary, he says that when Moshe succeeded in doing that, when he achieved the, stat, the state of what's called Kabbalah, Kabbalah, literally receptivity, the ability to receive, then Hashem's presence actually started to shine through him because he was no longer blocking it out with his own self, his own ego, and, and, and instead he was letting it flow through him and he was manifesting that through his being. That's what we're trying to become. We're trying to become a conduit 
for the divine energy that is literally radiating into ourselves. Our very consciousness is an, is an extension of that divine self. And so we're trying to basically open up that space to allow, to allow that to shine through. Now, what is that? So, it, so that's the definition of hod. The idea of that glow, that, it, that, that shine that of Hashem's self shining through you, that's what hod is. But let's look at that a little more carefully. Why is that the opposite of netzach? Well, it doesn't mean to submit just to kind of, like in some kind of silly, shallow way, like, oh, I submit to you, whatever you are. But it, it does in a certain way mean you have to open yourself up and let go of all your preconceived notions about like who you are. And this is these are the things that I did that I made. You're kind of like your identity. That's what we do in the world, unfortunately, especially today. It's very popular to attach ourselves to certain things in our lives, whether it's our careers or our money or our bodies, our sexual feelings. And there's so many different things that we try to attach ourselves to and say, this is who I am. And then we rigidly grab onto that because we're scared. We feel like the world is so chaotic. So many things are happening. I need something to hold on to in myself to feel like... Like, I really understand myself. And the idea here is in order to actually really be, to receive, to become more, you have to let go of what you think you are and open yourself to what you actually are able to be much more fully, the, thing that, the things that are beyond that. And so you have to actually submit in a certain way. You have to submit the ego part of you and basically say, that part of me, I have to say, I have to bow, I have to bow. that part has to bow out, literally. Like, has to basically say, I'm, as much as I think that this is what makes me special, I'm not special because of all, any of those labels or any of those things that I'm associated with. The real me, the endless me that is beyond, that's why I'm special. My true self-worth comes from all of those things, not from anything having to do with my body or anything like that or, or any of my other characteristics, my attributes. None of those are the reason why I'm special. I'm special because I'm an endless self. And when I can get that ego piece out of the way, that can then start to shine through. That is the characteristic of a hod. And so we can understand that the idea of that, that why, that's, why that's called a glow, because when you see a person like that, they literally have a radiance. It doesn't necessarily mean just that they literally glow physically, although in the story in the Torah, it seems like Moshe was glowing. It's more than that. It's the idea that the radiance of the self, that intangible self that we started with in the beginning of this video, the idea that you are this intangible self that is beyond and that somehow it's being manifest into the world through these 10 tools, these 10 layers. So one of the tools you have to use to manifest ma manifest that is your ability to submit, to be, to be more receptive, to submit the ego part and be more receptive to reality, to let reality then give you all the gifts that are there just waiting to be given to you, to be received by you. You have to open yourself in that way and let that flow through. And that's the idea of that radiance. And when a person lives that way, I mean, one of the ways that people who live that way really radiate is just with basic enjoyment of life because they basically look at the world as a place that's filled with gifts and filled with things just constantly flowing to us. And, and, and instead of being attached to our ego fixations and saying, I need to think about myself in this way to feel good about myself, you can actually let go of that and actually just feel good about just being alive. And then you can just be happy and your, and your face shines with that enjoyment of just accepting your reality. And then, of course, you should try that. You have to use the Netzach component too to sometimes try to then step forward and make changes happen. We have to also strive, which is why Netzach and Hod are opposite. You have to have Hod and Netzach. But to at least delve into the Hod side and then use that as the baseline, which is the key to feeling happy, to accept what your life is, and then moving from that to sometimes knowing when to activate your netzach to try to make change happen from a dominating place, that will be kind of then syn uh, synchronizing those two things and really bring, 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 being able to bring them together to create a higher harmony, which really is the center line, the esod. So that's the idea of Hode. Hopefully that was clarifying and helpful and that you enjoyed that. And if you have any questions, definitely drop them in the comments. You can subscribe and like this video if you liked it. And looking forward to having you joining for the next one.